Welcome to LLB School's another International Career Webinar Series talk on successful journeys of biotechnologists and bioinformaticians. Today we have with us Dr. Girinath Bilai and co-hosting with Dr. Mahesh and Dr. Abhishek. So now there are some instructions for the participants in the WebEx platform as well as the YouTube. So participants are requested to kindly turn off their microphone as well as their webcam so that we will have a better webinar session. Also, if you have a question, kindly post the question in the chat box or in the YouTube as comment. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notification for our upcoming sessions. And as mentioned, so the feedback link will be provided in the WhatsApp group around 7.45 p.m. And you are supposed to give your name and email correctly so that you will get the names properly in your certificates. And now to Abhishek. Abhishek will now introduce the speaker. Thank you. Uh, hello, I am Abhishek, a postdoctoral research scientist at the VIBK Center for Cancer Biology, Belgium. I thank Mahesh and other organizers of the LLB school for giving me an opportunity to host this session. Before we start the presentation, I wish to introduce the guest speaker for today, Dr. Girinath Pillai. Many of you might know him as a program coordinator for the Drug Discovery Hackathon 2020 program organized by Government of India. Dr. Pillai is a research scientist at Nairo Research and the founder of Zastra Innovations Bengaluru. He has more than 12 years of experience in drug target identification, drug discovery and repurposing using chemometrics, molecular modeling and machine learning techniques. He carried out his PhD with Professor Katritsky at University of Florida and Professor Carrelson University of Tartu. His work on mosquito repellents with the US Department of Agriculture using structure activity relationships and machine learning methodologies has attracted many global collaborators for scientific findings. He also has handled industrial projects from Henkel, ExxonMobil, Johnson & Johnson, Eastman in the United States. He has published 37 research articles in peer-reviewed international journals, two US patents, and also co-authored a book chapter. Currently, he is guiding a PhD student registered under VIT in the area of aging. He also pro actively provides answers to many queries asked in our LL Bioinfo Telegram group. Given his diverse experience, there could not be a better speaker to guide us about bioinformatics careers. I warmly welcome Dr. Pillai to share his experiences with us. Uh, over to you, Dr. Pillai. Thank you so much uh, to the whole team of LLB as well as Mahesh uh, for giving me an opportunity. So it's a, a great pressure to discuss about the journey. Uh, that's where we started and uh, discussed about this. So uh, the uh, area that we came in and we understood, now the things are completely different. So I just wanted to take you through a walkthrough, uh, a bit of my journey, and then, might be boring, <laughs> and then uh, we will slowly go into what is the expectations? And recently we did uh, with together with LLB a survey and I'll be giving you some board results about the survey as well as some of the queries already being posted on the group uh, and I'll be giving my opinions about it. And uh, the floor is open for uh, uh, interactive uh, question and answer sessions. So uh, just to uh, tell you a disclaimer, all are my personal opinion and does not have any connection with my employer, employer, others. And slide contains content and pictures or videos taken from other web articles, lectures and tutorials or other uh, surveys. And it uh, the copyrights owns to the respective others. And before uh, going to the slides, I thought usually we thank at the end of the slide. But when we talk about our journey, it's better to thank all of them at the beginning itself. Starting from our parents, then why our partner, our spouse, and all the critic people also who said no to me. Because they actually made us to think why there was a no rather than maybe or yes. That helps us to understand what is missing in us and please take it from me it really helped me a lot an institute i'm not naming the institute an institute in india where they said no to me uh, two years back they invited me 
to give a keynote lecture. So, and I'm really thankful to that institute and to the person who said no to me. That made me to think what was lacking in me to, for that particular person to say no to me when I was applying for an internship there, to be precise. So it is very important critics should be taken positively for improving and to focus on what talent you have to look at. It's not about degree, it's more about other things that you have to look at. And also thanking all the teachers, guides, supervisors and well-wishers, including my students and interns. I had uh, uh, since four years more than 72 interns with me, as well as the group members, of course, my colleagues too, I had learned many things from them. It, to be precise and uh, uh, to be honest with you, uh, my PhD student, uh, her name is Ambli. Uh, she was my inspiration to get into aging uh, field of research. Before that, I didn't talk about aging. Of course, I worked on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, but not uh, to that focused area. But uh, she was uh, bringing up that and it was so much interesting to me. So learning from students too and colleagues, motivators and inspirators. Sometimes we need some energetic uh, energizes like vitamins, right? So motivators and inspirators helps us to do that. Goosebumps are required in order in between. Not always criticism is going to help you to improve. Sometimes a positive note is also required. Friends, acquaintances too, and people also who trusted me and gave opportunities. Unless you get opportunities, how can you prove yourself? That is where I get many questions when I go for panel discussion. Sir, until unless industry, is going to give us a job how can you expect we should be an experienced candidate someone should start giving a job until unless how can we say that we are experienced everybody is asking now experienced candidates how do we get experienced freshers so it's, it's a very well uh, good question and relevant question so i really thank uh, the people who trusted me and also gave opportunity to start with my career and also currently all my clients who trust on me to continue with the projects and research. These are a few picks, uh, some of them from US, from Estonia, uh, from my homeland, where, and also friends, just to uh, pick them up and to remember them. Anyway, so let's see how the academic journey, uh, too, sometimes too personal, but excuse me for that. So I started with my 10th and dreamt about UPSC. That's where I was thinking about. I have to go for civil services. That's where I uh, started and ended up my 10th standard. When I went to plus two, things changed. I bought a PC uh, early days, okay, where I paid almost 60,000 rupees for a computer with 128 MB RAM, okay, not GB. <laughs> and then started tutoring small kids and wanted to become a computer engineer. But unfortunately, plans did not work because that time there was neat like uh, entrance examinations didn't get through uh, for the good colleges. Uh, so I ended up choosing a uh, bachelor's in biochemistry, right? When I started uh, exploring projects in biochemistry, I came to know about uh, RASMOL. RASMOL was the first tool I touched when I was doing my chemistry project, which inspired me to understand about protein structures, amino acids, and get to know about bioinformatics. And I was so happy because at least something this now related to bio computers. So I can relate bio and computers some way or the other. But uh, at that time, I don't know what is really bioinformatics, just started with it. And then after uh, my studies, I went for teaching and there, there was a requirement during that time. There's, to be a lecturer, you should have MPhil. So I didn't have bioinfo as MPhil, so I took biotech but choosing some projects related to bioinfo. But later, almost after six to seven years later, I understood that, yeah, we have to go for focus on a PhD. Decided and focused and went with a medicinal computational chemistry. Uh, the reason behind it, I'll tell you a bit later, why I shifted from bioinfo to a computational chemistry or drug discovery or even having a not going for biochemistry related. And then while going with research journey, I started as a project fellow at University of Kerala at its IGNO Center for the project to design course, 
and take care of lab practicals. And then joined as an adjunct scholar at the University of Florida uh, with a funded project from USDA. Uh, then only I joined for PhD. So uh, there was an earning, there was a stipend, and then went for it. So carried out research, learned how to write papers the first time. And of course, there was cultural shock and many more other challenges also there initially. But it was very seamlessly fine because my professor, Professor Katruski, unfortunately, he's no more, uh, who was 86 years old during that time, was very supportive and friendly to us, to all the members. We were about 48 members in the group. Then uh, became a research chemist at the uh, University of Tartuot, Estonia, uh, through the Estonian government's um, uh, fellowship, uh, which was for one year, and carried out research and designed compounds with significance to support experimental chemistry. And then applied for Marie Curie Fellowship and uh, was appointed at Molcode Limited. It was with the University of Helsinki and was working on Parkinson's disease. Again, to identify lead molecules using SAR methodologies. And then joined as a research advisor to VIT and guiding my PhD student. Of course, takes few classes yearly. And in a role of uh, both at Shastra as well as Nairo, where it's not about uh, uh, publications, it's not about patenting, it's more about where it is reliable and reproducible. Whatever data we are publishing, all the raw data are available in my personal GitHub, even for QSR, you can reuse it. And that's where, just to give a two, uh, little bit hint about the, my PhD research. So uh, Department of Defense uh, also uh, was looking at insect repellent system, right? Uh, this is uh, perimetrin on uniforms, right, on the clothes, and DEET on exposed skin and properly worn uniform as well as perimetrin treated with bed nets. The project was from war fighters because they stay inside the forest for many days or months and they have to carry a little bit amount and it should be more active and not to be too toxic to the humans. DEET has its own toxic effects on pregnant women and also to young children. So that's where we it came up with a project that how we can overcome that. And second thing was bed net. Bed net, uh, uh, the sustenance or uh, retaining of the, um, um, the particular repellent is a bit challenging. So either it might vaporize or while they wash or try to do something, it goes off. So retaining on the polymers, it's very, very important. So we did apply SAR methodologies and others. But in order to get that, uh, that is where we have to understand. I'll be discussing in next few slides. We need to have wet lab studies to be carried out in order to collect data that is required for bioinformaticians or computational modelers or anyone. So here we were working on Aegis aegypti, the type of mosquito responsible for yellow fever, or it's called as yellow fever mosquito. It has limited efficacy, tolerant varieties of Aegis aegypti, that is called DEET. And then skin irritation is there, possible neurotoxicities are there, plasticizing action on polymeric materials are also the uh, properties and relatively high cost. So our aim was to come up with a new uh, molecule, which is overcoming all these challenges and having good repellent activity on mosquitoes. On your right hand side, whatever you see, uh, what, uh, human volunteers will be there where you have to insert your hand with uh, the box full of mosquitoes grown in the lab. And then uh, where you see this particular a small opening, that's where you apply your repellent and see whether it comes and bite on your hand or not. So that's where uh, you try to do minimum effective dosage, uh, you quantify uh, the repellency. Later, going through the professional journey, during my schooling itself uh, with my dad, and uh, we were trying to uh, see how things goes, right? So was doing some designing, branding, and sales. Even I was, I, was, I was so much wondering nowadays when I was preparing for this slide, I went to a chartered accountant to sit and study how the accounting is being done. And uh, when I finished my BSc biochemistry, I went to a hospital and stayed there for eight months to learn 
how to take blood from your uh, blood uh, from your vein and then uh, going for hematology or biochemical experiment. I mean, what to say, a, a blood test analysis, right? Counting platelets, counting WBCs, all those things. It's a different experience. So we, uh, more thing was experience from that. What I learned was customer interaction, how to talk to people. Uh, and also meeting the design needs of specific people. So understanding the requirements, branding and advertisements, how it uh, conveys the message to other people. So that is what we learned from those experiments. I might have learned irrelevant things, uh, sometimes relevant, but those were really helping us to uh, structure how we have to live in this world. And then I became a lecturer at Vinayaga Missions uh, as a, and also a daily, daily learner. I have to sit and read for the next day uh, to present the class or take the class. Otherwise, there are smarter kids there who are going to question you and you should be a daily learner. Then I joined as a support scientist with Axelris, uh, one of the Axelris partner in uh, Bangalore, uh, but uh, they rejected my offer after the interview saying, I'm overqualified, oh, come on. And later, uh, it was interesting, I'm really thankful to the team. They accepted me, but things worked out later. And then a research scholar at US, came out with around 33 international papers, US patent, book chapter, and for industrial project, and now sitting as a founder and CEO of Innovations. To be honest, challenging, because it's a startup, right? But now it is not a startup. We are already five-year-old company, having around 12 to 13 people working with us, uh, made a good amount of transactions, having a very good customer base across the country, and neighboring countries too. So that's what I said. When you when you have those responsibility, market influence is very important, and had to work. Not right now. Had to work almost uh, uh, fourteen to sixteen hours per day and high risk because until unless business happens, no salary. And not only for you, you have to make money for your employees also. Of course, they do work, but our responsibility is more on us. And currently, as a volunteer. I'm a coordinator for a drug discovery hackathon, which is uh, as rightly uh, started uh, where um, the LLB team was introducing me. Now, passing on the journey, I told you bioinformatics. I want to tell you why I shifted from bioinformatics to uh, medicinal computational chemistry or more of drug discovery. Both are different, not bioinformatics, not the, the both are different. When you talk about bioinformatics, it's to extract analyze and understand the information of biology or life sciences life science again is a collection of different diverse areas right so it's not just biology plus it i have seen in many presentation even when i was doing bioinfo i used to tell the same way it is just biology plus it you know it's more than that you have to add plus mathematics and statistics too without that bioinformatics is zero so that's where we have to understand what is the importance that we are looking at. It's completely data and analysis. And you see this, this is a particular publication from IOP taken in 1973. Even during that day, they had a thought about, don't just sit there. If you have processed all the data there is, go out, find more data. This is exactly when we try to do, we try to find some data and go to our supervisor. They say, is this enough? Can you have more data? because we want to reduce the false positives. Your statistics parameter should much better, look better. The deviation should reduce if you have more iterative data. I mean, um, repeated experiments if you contact. So we are still looking for more data, but the data should be more curated. Don't think that you can put any data that will be a garbage in and garbage out. So you should be very careful. So data and analysis is a almost a major part of uh, bioinformatics. Now, what constitutes bioinformatics? Biology, of course, the problem, uh, and computer science and mathematics, you're using them to solve these problems, and altogether you call them as bioinformatics. There is no drug discovery here. There is no chemistry here. There is no physics here. Of course, we talk about proteomics, genomics, everything, but it has its own neighbors, right? Or uh, that's what we call it as partners. But as I rightly said earlier, you need to have in vitro data. You have to carry out experimental analysis in order to get data for to perform in silico analysis. This slide was prepared, I 
around 2003, I just picked up from my old slide deck. Uh, I have seen this in earlier in some other slides too. So of course I have taken from others, right? So DNA extraction, 3D gel, PCR, microarray, that's where in vitro you have to do for characterization and getting up more data. And after that, you do comparative studies, modeling, analysis, pairwise alignment, many more, multiple sequence alignment, more, uh, all those things comes into the in silico. Again, once you come up with a hypothesis or rationalization, you have to validate them and there should be confirmatory tests. So you are, you are in the middle wherever you see in silico. So in vitro is any way required because when you try to publish right now in very good journal, I'm not talking about high impact factor journal, otherwise there are many good journals. They, when you put, just put in silico work, let it be any work, any tremendous amount of data you have, they just say a reply saying that speculative results, speculative data, not under the scope of this journal. That's only because your hypothesis or rationalization couldn't be confirmed through some in vitro test. We don't, I don't agree that in vitro is 100% accurate, but at least in, on live, real life, we are trying to test it and try to prove it. Of course, there will be error. But in silico, error chances are more because it's a prediction and we use statistical predictive models and approaches to do that. Some statistical, some dynamic and different models and approaches are there. Now who are the neighbors of bioinformatics? That's where now I am working on as a neighbor of uh, uh, bioinformatics, not directly into that. So biochemistry, this is now I am correlating why I picked up bioinformatics after my biochemistry. In order to understand mechanistic driven action of your different metabolic pathways or mode of action of uh, your uh, drug molecule, whether it could be a antagonist or agonist, you have to understand mechanisms. And biochemistry is going to help you understand that mechanism. And bioinformatics is going to help you analyze that mechanism, role of target, validate the target and identify the target. Of course, proteomics and genomics relationship. And then we have programming, mathematics and statistics. I have to put all this together, right? Because if you, if you know programming, you have to know mathematics. If you know mathematics, you have to know statistics because programming is required for your data analysis or some prediction. And for data analysis, you need to know probabilistic scoring or calculus or regression methods or even machine learning methods, whatever we say. Earlier days, whatever we were doing statistics, again, that is what we are now shouting out as machine learning, right? There also we did the, the earlier days, we also did genetic algorithm. We were using it. Of course, Autodoc uses it, but we indirectly used it. Then we have SVM, support vector machines. So uh, uh, a bioinformatician should be should not be a user of a software, should be a developer or should be a customizer of an algorithm. That's what the expectation was. I'm not, I was not good at it. Uh, that's why I didn't go for bioinformatics, to be precise. And then you have chemistry and biophysics. One of my favorite subjects is chemistry. Right, and that's how now you know why I didn't choose bioinformatics for my PhD. It's it's my personal thing. Don't think that this is common for everyone. No, it's it's my personal interest. I'll go to that point. Uh, it's there's a big difference between uh, what is known, what is demand, and what is your personal preference. So we have to uh, foresee that. So uh, chemistry and biophysics also where you are understanding about drug interactions, uh, crystallography then protein protein interactions molecular dynamics and also uh, you also get into genomics and uh, proteomics that's where you look at now i have uh, brushed up few of my opinions based on some of the questions that is being put forward by uh, some of the participants earlier so uh, we did some homework before this presentation now this was um, a particular survey that was conducted in my uh, twitter uh, in my Facebook and other groups in WhatsApp and Telegram, including a, a co good contribution from LLB School also. So this is the outcome of uh, the particular survey. Where do you prefer to do higher studies? And we listed few of the country countries and we found these many percentage. And I will tell you, reveal how many votes we got. So I'm so happy to see that most of them opted India. They wanted to do PhD in India. 
and then comes Europe, and then comes uh, Uni United States, and then comes with uh, Canada, UK, and goes on with Australia, China, Korea, and others. And we received about 278 votes together, clubbing all the uh, social mediums uh, surveys. So this is really, really encouraging that uh, majority of uh, uh, group is preferring to do the PhD in India. There are many reasons, plus and minus. Uh, I'm not, I do not want to go for very contradictory uh, kind of statements, but if any questions comes up, we can discuss that during that time. So thanking you all uh, to the people who uh, took part in this particular survey. Uh, and we started very recent, like September 20th. So just within six days, we got this many uh, votes. Thank you so much. Another question was, what is the basis of choosing masters or PhD topics or subjects? And what could be the future prospect of getting employed? Very two important questions. So uh, this is where I have to put my examples here. I have plus and minus by choosing and switching cross um, cross subjects, which I will discuss in my next slide where someone has already asked this question. But the basis of choosing was, I understood that I'm not good at a particular area. So I thought I have to switch and that is the right time to switch to a different area. So that you have to realize. The top interest is very important. What is interest to you? But most of the time we think, what is the demand? What is the trend right now? See, right now there is a trend. Tomorrow it might change. Once you pass out after four years of PhD, uh, it might change. So we need to know what is your interest. Hotcakes are there, of course. I don't deny that, but it is topic of your interest. You might have read several topics. What is you more admired and more impressed? Where you have much more understanding rather than lightness. Then you also want to understand what to achieve. And on this particular topic, is there any uh, related direct social relevance event? For example, today was a CSIR's Foundation Day. I was watching their live. I could see there were many innovation awards and technology awards. And uh, many uh, prof young scientists and other um, uh, professors or scientists who got these awards they actually innovated some uh, new products which is readily marketed so that's what we are looking at even some of the phd research work is being marketed not all all research works are possible in that way at least we have to see in that angle even uh, my uh, work which is on mosquito repellency uh, that is also going for commercialization right again for the government's use so now it is under the polymer optimization they are working under bed nets they have to uh, work on the repellents and see now do the testing. It takes time, but still there is some social relevance. Commercialization possibilities, that is where patenting. So keep in mind, patent is not for adding to your CV. It might add points to you during interviews or others. But for me and for many, patent means making money. The one patent uh, which is mentioned is the US page is already commercialized. Someone has already purchased the technology. I, I cannot reveal the person. So they have already purchased the technology uh, license from University of Florida. So they, they, they get, they, uh, and we get the perks for that, of course. The inventors also get a, a share of perks for that. So this is uh, commercialization possibilities is a patent that you have to also foresee. Now coming to the future prospects in getting employed, employability. For be more employable, you should be a good learner. It's not that uh, someone should ask you to learn. No, you have to, you, you see, uh, during my days, uh, ac internet accessibility was there, but you have to wait in line for an internet surfing center and you have to sit for uh, out of your house, okay? And then the speed was 64 kpbs, right? Now we are talking about 64 mbps. So now you have more uh, resources right in hand to you, but, and so they're all positive, but you have to make a decision. The prospects of choosing cross major in life sciences. The basic sciences and it's important, it's always uh, very, very trivial because even if someone is going to ask me uh, whether I should go for bachelors in biotechnology, bioinformatics, biochemistry, or should I go for chemistry, physics, 
a botany zoology. If a person is going for biochemistry, I always recommend BSc, please go for chemistry. Basic science has its own importance. That is what is missing. When you go for interviews also, your, most of the questions will be basic sciences. If there are many PhD students attending this session, uh, if you have gone through these PhD admission interviews, for example, our premium institutes like IAC and others, you would have already uh, came across these basic science questions. And also challenges to meet a certain job descriptions. You need to know what is required for a specific job and you have to be prepared for that. And try to relate and justify the choices. This is where I want to tell you. So I took biochemistry. I then went to bioinformatics. Relatively, I understood that we need to know a, a lot more about uh, mathematics, linear algebra, probability, and also a bit more about scripting. And then only I can survive much more in uh, bioinformatics field, the core bioinformatics I'm talking about. Right now, when you're talking about NGS, right, next gen sequencing, of course, data analysis where people are sitting and study R package, Python programming, Spider ID, or Jupyter notebooks, all these are coming into the picture. It's again bioinformatics. So during that time, earlier days, uh, early 2000s, uh, I was not having uh, that reach of resources where to learn this properly. Even there were uh, very great institutions like, uh, oh, sorry for that. So there were great institutions like uh, NI, NIIT and some other Aptex and all during uh, our era. Uh, they were also not able to give any uh, courses like uh, Python or Perl or anything like that. They were more focused as a bioinformatician. He had a startup during 1999, even in 2002, on machine learning. And now uh, he's uh, with as a vice president in one of the telecom industry in India. And he's a, a machine learning expert now. He did bioinformatics also, right? So that, that is where the cross major comes into the picture. Supporting myself during my study. It again depends upon country specific. Within India, of course, there are fellowships available, uh, stipends are available right now, many and plenty of them. So it should be country specific, part-time jobs and earnings are possible, depends upon. And also teaching assistant, research assistant, and also testing volunteers, even though they call it as volunteer, you get paid. And independent consultants, arts and culture, freelancing, fellowships and scholarships, including stipend, depends upon what you apply. So all this way, you can support yourself during the study. So myself also, I had a stipend. I had been part-time working for a company when I was doing my uh, MSc. Of course, you have to get a prior acceptance and agreement letter from your institution because they have to permit you to do that. So it depends. And are scholarships useful? Of course, yes. Prestigious scholarships cover most of the expenses, including airfare, relocation, insurance, accommodation, course fee, extra. And it is also an added value to your CV. But how to approach for these scholarships? It again depends. You have to talk about science rather than just asking about scholarship. I've seen many people writing to me, sir, is there any job in your company? That's it. Thanks, their name. I don't think that is the right way. The right way is try to uh, find a good rapport first. Try to understand whether you are on the same page of the expectations of your recruiter. It could be a professor, institute, or company, whatever it could be. Try to meet their expectations, understand their expectations, and then propose your idea. I am thinking of joining your institution. Is there any scholarship available? That's where we have to. So we need to have good amount of patience and perseverance. So it's not about the um, uh, job. It's not about salary. It's not about uh, scholarship. First, you have to understand what is their requirement, scientific, because we are talking about science here, right? And compile your, start preparing your research proposal. And keep in your mind, do not copy paste, not even a single line. When I was in University of Florida, every year we get the statistics. Uh, one particular area, year, many number of applications were rejected just because of plagiarism in the research proposal and statement of purpose. So kindly be careful, do not copy paste. You have to compile. It takes time. Start doing it today if you are trying to apply abroad. 
or other places. Even Indian institutes are also asking about research proposals. Statement of purpose is also something very important. Recommendation letter. See, recommendation letter, of course, given by your supervisor and guide, but you have to help them with data, right? Uh, if I'm going and asking a recommendation letter from my PhD uh, supervisor right now, after five years down the line, some many more things have been happened. So I have to update him with my data. It's not just CV is going to help him. So you can uh, have a draft to just give him an idea. Then he uh, drafts it according. That's the right way to do it. So prepare your own recommendation letter and be honest. It's not that if you mention something negative about you are not going to get the job. It's about trust. It's about understanding. Uh, when I was when I applied to Professor Katrowski, he asked for reference. I don't know why. Uh, usually we give two or three references nowadays. Uh, this is back uh, in way many years back. So uh, he asked for seven references. Give seven references. He wrote to all of them, and whoever not replied to his email, he picked up the phone and spoke to them. And uh, interestingly, when I went there, a professor told me this. He was more. Uh, uh, Fifty percent of his questions were related to science, uh, my education capabilities, and other 50% was more of teamwork and other things. So that is what they are looking for, expectation. Are you a good learner, listener, teamwork? All those things they have to look at. And MSc, PhD, integrated courses. What are its benefits, prevalence across the globe? In some cases, in India, I had a bad experience of integrated word. Uh, 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 one of my uh, students, when they applied for a national uh, fellowship, they said, they do not give for integrated uh, PhD, uh, this particular stipend. I was surprised because integrated is something approved already by the authorities who are giving the degrees, right? Anyway, so uh, anyway, that, that could be overcoming as it goes on, it will be getting optimized. So you have to be more concerned about how many years of studies being completed when you go for abroad. When you go for Europe, Germany or US, they look at what, how many years of studies you have completed. That's what they look at. Integrated courses are really good. In, uh, in US, I know only about University of Florida, others I don't know, I don't want to comment. So uh, there I know that if you join for an integrated uh, PhD, if you, are, if you already completed your MS credits, you, if you want to get the certificate, you can do that. You can always do that. Uh, and if you want to discontinue, you can discontinue, not a problem at all. Uh, but of course, you have to pay the fees for the course. Uh, and uh, for the PhD, again, you can continue. But in some cases in India, uh, in, in some of the integrated courses, I, I don't know all, some they do not allow you to have in between break and take your degree and go. Some might be there, I'm not sure. Job opportunities for a bioinformatician graduates in India. Huh. Now, the job, greatest job opportunity, what I know is scientific writer. Many known people to me, even students and interns, if you have a good writing skills, scientific writing precisely, uh, you get good jobs in many, many companies, including Siemens are also recruiting, right? Scientific writing is something, a writer, then a quality control writer, a documentation. This is where I can see many jobs. So you don't require a bioinformatics there, but still, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Otherwise, it's more of a data science of understanding uh, sequence analysis, NGS, genomics, data curation. So in Bangalore, I can see a trend. Um, there are a lot of data curation companies available. Uh, so creating a database from patents, creating database from uh, journal data, chemical data, or G uh, sequence data, many more. So these are all uh, paid databases, could be, because you're curating it, right? So uh, data curation jobs are also increasing. And of course, they prefer more of bioinformatics and bio-related people because you need to understand, you need to have a domain expertise because you need to read, understand, and then convert it to uh, data, right? So, and these are the other, other thing. But when you come to drug discovery or design of molecules, they do not take bioinformatics. They take a person who has understanding of chemistry. And I don't want to mention the degree here. It could be pharmaceutical chemistry, pharmacology, medicinal chemistry, organic chemistry, whatever it is, but not bioinformatics. Please keep that in mind. We realized this during 2004, 2003 itself, where the pharma was not ready to take any bioinformatics people. Of course, bioinformatics people are required for 
uh, pharma industry, but in different domain, not in drug discovery. So that is where you have to um, uh, make your objectives very clear where I have to work and what I have to take when I'm doing my MS. During my time, there was nobody to tell me and uh, guide me. Somehow it worked well. Uh, thank God. Thank others, also teachers. So upskilling, that is something for the career growth. So this was an interesting question saying that uh, for getting uh, um, promotions and uh, for higher education, do we need to do, uh, sorry, for career growth, do we need to do upskilling or higher education? It requires both. In some cases, we require, they say we require, oh, sorry. Uh, some uh, some cases, we require higher education. For example, MBA is required, right? Sometimes. Sometimes we require just upskilling, what I do. Right now, I am working on machine learning approaches for aging-related studies. Now I am upskilling. I didn't, I have not, I've done PD, was very fruitful and productive, making learning and teaching, all those things coming up. So you have to go through new techniques, approaches, data analysis, and keep updated with knowledge. You have to read, 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 read. I'm not talking about papers. I'm talking about many more other stuff, which I'll tell you in a, in a, in a moment. We'll soon finish this. It's almost done. Now, a few quotes which you have to keep in mind. Don't confuse between what I like and what I find easy. What I like is, is something that I uh, like by myself because you understood it. And what you understood is what you find it easy, right? So, but otherwise you will say, I like uh, mathematics, okay? I will do mathematics, but do I get a job? Um, but you have to see that whether it is capable or not. I like uh, um, uh, dancing, but do I know uh, to dance properly? Have I learned about it? This is all you have to sit and understand. What I like versus what I find easy. Don't think that what is easy is always what you like. And what you, for example, to make it very simple explanation, during plus two uh, studies and all, uh, we try to avoid mathematics because for me, uh, for us mathematics, some, for some of them, mathematics will be difficult. For some, it is favorite subject, they get good, full out of her. Why? Because they understood and did it. The others, they tried to understand but couldn't. So there, sh there could have been some push or pull there or some resources to help them to come up, but didn't work out. So what you understand things properly, that's where you find things very easily. So you don't confuse between what I like and what I find. It's like when people come for internship, sir, can you tell me something easy to do project? There's nothing like easy to do project. All project has plan A, plan B, plan C, because hurdles and hiccups will be there everywhere. Dream high, work smart, and be proactive. When you go for uh, commercial uh, industries, even, even in academy also, you should be proactive. Don't wait for someone else to tell you what to do. You have to check what is the positive and negative of about it and just start doing it. Of course, you can read and a lot of experience. So you have many more videos and blogs available who talks about experience. And the future completely, your future, okay? I'm not talking about the world. Your future completely depends upon what you do today, what you drive, what where you start. It all depends, right? I, I didn't know that uh, I will uh, uh, end up uh, looking at machine learning now, which I did, of course, in 2004, 2005, when I was doing QSAR, I used uh, SVM models, genetic algorithm models uh, to generate uh, the training set. But that time we didn't call them as machine learning, right? Uh, we, we had a statistical approaches or machine learning, but we didn't give a good hype on that. But now it's just AI and machine learning. And nothing will work unless you do. So you have to try. Most of the time, you'll be reluctant. Oh, will it work? Will it work? Try it out. If it is not going to harm you a lot on money and time, try it out. Nothing will work unless you do. These are not sayings by me, by great other experienced people. I have mentioned the names in the box. Now, why I discussed about all these things? Because of this very shocking report by Times of India. What they found is, Around 80% of the engineers are unemployable for any jobs in the knowledgeable economy for the future technologies. For example, AI, mobile, cloud, web, etc., etc. It's not only about biology. I'm talking about bioinformatics comparing with expected future technologies. So what's next? We are in the era of Industry 4.0. 
where people are looking at robotics, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, big data, even intelligent, flexible and distribution production. I'll tell you an example for this. Uh, a, a very good uh, friend of mine as well as uh, a scientist at NCL Pune, uh, you can send a compound, right, a PDB ID, just a PDB ID uh, via email to a specific email address. Automatically it does docking on Zinc database and get back to the result. Nobody is sitting there. That is called robotics or Internet of Things. Still applicable there in drug discovery too. So we are in that era. So uh, to be honest and clear with you, don't be an user, be the creator. That is what the expectation of tomorrow's bioinformatics field. Until unless you do that, of course, all others will also get the job, but aim for that. And this is again expectations on bio or pharma 4.0. See, earlier days when we do biotechnology, oh, can we do marketing? Can we do we have a fresh, uh, good, fancy word called as supply chain management, blockchain. This is where all things comes into the picture. Logistics management, sales, marketing, getting things into the market. All things comes here. It, there is no nothing like biotechnologist or pharma or pharmaceutical chemist, nothing like that. Everyone has to go with it. Now, there are a few things that you have to consider for am I ready for the future? You have to graduate. You, there should be graduates with the right attitude and aptitude. Communication skills are very important. Individuality, that is behavioral traits are also very important. Critical thinking, collaboration. Etiquette and manners, accountability and responsibility, work-life balance and priority. You have to know where to say no. You have to say no if you cannot do. You're overburdened with jobs. In US, I learned something that very, very proactively. When professor was asking some of my colleague, he said, no, I don't have time for this week. Uh, usually we don't say no. We never learn to say no. We say yes. We might not meet deadlines. We fail. The trust is gone. That is what we have to look at. We have to prioritize things. Nobody is teaching us that. Uh, otherwise, we have to go behind. Career building. You got a job, but I have to go for next steps. So career build also. I have to improve my skill sets also. Whatever skill sets you have, you have to improve. You have to update. Bo both ways it is also look. So work-life balance is something I want to very much focus because it's very important to make us stress-free and productive and more focused. And keep updated with your technologies challenges, success stories in your area, including failures. Because until unless you know how it failed, you shouldn't repeat, right? So it's how not to do is much more uh, better understandable for a person in real life rather than how to do learning things, right? On my conclusions, a focus on converting information to knowledge by learn, try, fail, and further succeed. Upskill and get hands-on experience and prove them by applying on project. Take a project by yourself. Why someone should give you a project? Try to apply whatever you learn from there. There you get a real example. It's not about where you do. Earlier days it was there. I agree with you. When I was doing my PhD, it was many things where you do. Nowadays things have changed a lot. It's about how and what you did. That is more important. What is the work you did? I know a person who has only one single publication. He is being well paid. It's a very good position now. And the journal is just one publication in nature. So that is the difference. By telling I have 100 publications, but uh, I, I didn't do innovate something good, you're still active and working. But what we do contribute, that is important. So reproducibility, reliability, and converting it to something with social relevance is what people are looking at. So uh, that's all uh, from me, but uh, uh, these are some of the LLB school's uh, uh, vision uh, where I will complete this uh, because uh, uh, this was on the acknowledgement uh, uh, slides. So this is an initiative from LLB school where it is to connect students uh, with active researchers and professionals belonging to the field of biology, biotech, bioinformatics, and its allied subjects globally. Uh, really, really great uh, group, actually. I, I'm there uh, since few months. And also, uh, they provide uh, every possible services to bring biologists and bioinformaticians together under one single uh, roof. Because there are a lot of discussions happening. People raise questions and a lot of opinions and perspectives come in. 
uh, to come to a conclusion. And you could also sign up uh, as there is a website, llbschool.org, uh, where you there look for collaborators, freelancers, tutors, and expert consultants. And uh, uh, they also would like to thank uh, their collaborators because uh, Center for Plant Molecular Biology and Biotechnology at uh, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University and IMOT uh, Agri Forum. Uh, that's where uh, they collaborate with LLB uh, Forum. It's really wonderful. I have been uh, taking part in many of the discussions and I would appreciate uh, uh, if you look forward to getting engaged with discussions and uh, uh, perspectives and opinions and also many more other support and services you please um, uh, sign up with them uh, for uh, different social media. And I also now take opportunity to thank everybody patiently listening and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, these are my social handles. You are free to contact me. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it was a wonderful talk. I think it was a wonderful talk. Uh, uh, and um, very few people I've seen in my life who really have an honest opinion and experience about their life and they want to share it with other people. Uh, you emphasize really well on opportunities, uh, generation of uh, experiments, wet lab data, and their data analysis. You also conveyed the right message to your audience by talking about team effort, leadership, uh, how bioinformatics is not just uh, computer science and bi uh, biology, but also involves mathematics, statistics. You also talked about how mechanisms also are important. So you have to go into the basic biochemistry or other basic sciences to get an understanding. You also gave uh, a really uh, long-term perspective for students to really uh, improve their skill sets and um, how to choose the right job for uh, their own uh, skill sets. You also talked about the requirements and most importantly, you focused on uh, uh, how you need to introspect, uh, uh, you, you need to do a self-introspection to uh, really um, find out uh, what you are uh, capable of doing. Uh, our imagination has no uh, boundaries, actually. Uh, yeah. I have. I think you covered most of the points. Maybe some of the questions would be a repeat, but some of our participants have some questions. And I personally mm -hmm. have some questions that might add up to what you have um, already uh, told. Um, so yeah, uh, like you, you have had a very diverse career profile. And I'm sure that there might be many experiences, which part some some part of which you've already shared. Do you have any important lessons that you learned from your experience about what choices uh, uh, you made in your life at what point or what uh, uh, made you choose uh, this particular career path where you are now? Yeah, um, uh, that's a very valid question and a very serious question too. This was my key point on the second point which, where I mentioned when I thanking people to thank all the critic and the people who said no to me. Even uh, when I chose bioinformatics during that time, it was nowhere. It was something new, very new. My dad told me when I was going for uh, getting out of my house to apply for the college, he said, this is your choice. You made the choice. Later, don't feel bad and come back to me. <laughs> then I said, no, I know what I'm doing. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I may, I think I made the right choice. I, I won't uh, uh, disappoint you. So the reason uh, why I took that decision was uh, when I did the project, I did an um, understanding about what is tomorrow, right? I'm talking about this about early 2000s, okay? So what is tomorrow? I, I had uh, read about it and understood a vision. So now I have to, what is the current uh, demand was something else. But uh, I don't want to work when I'm going to work, uh, come out of all these degrees and other things. So the challenging part was when people are going to criticize you, take it positively. Healthy criticisms are really going to help you to improve. And I'm very happy with uh, uh, whoever is going to compete with me because they help me to understand what is lacking in me, what I have improved. This, you have to take it more positively. I know that many of the time we feel bad. Uh, we feel so down and we are more discouraged. Take it the other way. You be very happy that someone pointed out your weakness and where you have to improve. This is the take-home message that I have during, during my all these diverse 
places. I had many, many challenges when people said no. I felt so bad. Even now also, I have felt bad. But now it's a very sweet uh, uh, no for me. That's where I am now. That's a really good point. That's a really, really good point. Um, yeah, uh, there is one person who, um, uh, Khan Rehan, who is asking about what are the bioinformatics opportunities in India as compared to abroad. So what are the different uh, choices? So uh, as I rightly mentioned, uh, scientific writing, data curation, uh, even in NGS, because in NGS, there are many companies are there, right? So outsourcing companies are there. But I know why you are, where, where this question is coming from. When you're looking for all these NGS, maybe for data curation data or scientific writing, you need more people there, maybe 10 or 20 people in a company or more than that. For data curation, even I have seen 100 and 300 people in a single firm. But when you're coming to uh, NGS analyst, you don't require more than two or three, even single person enough, more than enough. So that's where it will be a bit challenging. So in that case, you have to slightly turn to more of data analytics, right? We have very less people in India. We have many IT experts programming, so no denying. My wife is also a programmer and a developer. No problem with that. But a person with a biology domain who understands about biology and having good programming and scripting capability very few people not many and if there are many good people they are being hired by google siemens and big big shots so who is staying back in india so there are companies in india i know one company in uh, kolkata unexpectedly in kolkata because i why i say unexpected? because everybody talks about bangalore delhi mumbai pune chennai but i am so happy to see that they're a big team of AI and machine learning sitting in Kolkata. They have recruited recently around 12 of bioinformatic expertise, but all these bioinformatics people who are being recruited, they have data science knowledge. They know how to grow write Python codes. They know how to do statistics and data analysis. So that is what we have to look at. Change your priorities and start upskilling yourself based on the current requirements. I, I have a follow-up question to uh, this. So, yeah. you know, like in uh, syllabus of uh, bioinformatics and bachelors and masters, they, they keep on changing. And many times uh, you learn things which might not directly be related to your jobs. At the same time, the jobs that are there now would rely on some new skill sets, which we are never ta uh, taught in our masters and bachelors. So how to keep mm -hmm. ourselves updated about these changing requirements, let's say within the academia or, or the industry, what resources would you recommend? I don't blame anybody, but still I want to mention this. During my era of uh, learning, studying bioinformatics, it was more focused on biology. It was more focused on biodiversity and all those stuff. Our programming papers may be just one or two, that's it. Then one database management, done. But now I can see many changes happening. Uh, I don't know, uh, government universities or uh, institutes, but some deemed universities, the bioinformatics is under the computer science department and i oh. completely agree to that 100 percent because a computer engineer who after plus two anyway he is coming he might have learned or he might be having some knowledge about biology from his 10th standard of course yes so when he comes to computer science with a bachelor's or b-tech or b in bioinformatics he can brush up the biology but when you do a biology background based bioinformatics, he is not completely getting into programming. He is reluctant because he thinks that he is not good for that because his background was completely biomax, nothing into computer science. So for me, from my experience, I can understand, understand uh, computer science is something very much relevant where people have to take more courses on computer science related topic um, than biology. See, if you see in bioinformatics, after you study and you apply things, you can see you're talking about databases. You're talking about uh, uh, parameters. You're talking about statistics. You're talking about programming scripts. So where do you talk about biology and mechanism? Yes. So domain expertise is OK. But bioinformatician's role is completely into scripting and analysis. So you are upskilling or what? Uh, it's OK that uh, your college cannot change because we have to see resources there also. There might be having limited resources on teaching in different angles. 
the problem what you see difference is uh, you will write in your cv that you know python you will write in your cv that you know c++ database management sql but when you go for an interview all theoretical answers you answered but now they ask you write a program for this 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 we will give you 15 minutes you might not write because you learned in a way that only for those practicals you learned right but now it has improved a lot because students are going for internships and projects they get multi uh, disciplinary uh, perspectives and they are being pressurized and put on a specific project they have to sit refer books refer materials and um, code and write scripts so now things have improved so i would recommend if someone is want to stick on to bioinformatics the core bioinformatics there are many diverse variations of bioinformatics which i don't want to comment but the core bioinformatics please ensure that you know statistics as well as program um, there are two questions um, related to some specific sectors where bioinformatics can be applied, but uh, the uh, participants don't know if there is any direct application. Like, for example, there is a question by Hafida. She says that uh, she wants to ask that, mm -hmm. is there any domain for bioinformatics in the environmental industry? Uh, yes and no. Yes, in the sense, my first publication after going to us it was on environmental pollution but uh, there we apply chemistry unfortunately and we also uh, 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 checked what is the variations of uh, genetic variations based on this uh, pollution uh, but we didn't publish because we didn't get uh, what expected results or things didn't go well so we didn't publish that part but we published the chemistry part and uh, uh, testing and others so it is there uh, then accumulation uh, of uh, and changes in uh, environmental factors. What are the mutations that could happen uh, on bacteria and other other things which you can do using bioinformatics? So there are application. You have to see where you where you can go to the molecular level or what micro level you can see and uh, see what can be applied. Uh, there is another question from Joseph. Uh, he asks uh, whether. Uh, so uh, his interests lie in uh, the development of machine learning uh, models for analysis of biological data, drug discovery, and also uh, ML tools for study of uh, CRISPR-Cas systems. Uh, so his mm -hmm. question is, um, can you tell me, are these interests closely related or they are far apart since uh, you spoke about bioinformatics and also the design of drugs? So how are they interconnected, basically? Machine learning to drug discovery is more related to target identification, target validation, right? So you have to look in that perspective. Otherwise, machine learning is more focused on structure activity relationship to define the structure activity relationship. So you have a large pool of data set and trying to understand which is the key region of the molecule more active and which is making less active and to which helps you to make new derivatives of the molecules in drug discovery since the question was on drug discovery now uh, going forward to other things uh, you can always understand about uh, 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 for example um, yeah you have a compound with you and you want to identify a target how can you do so you have to combine np uh, that is natural processing language also like the text mining uh, or also data mining so data mining and text mining is also a way of uh, machine learning also which which combines these algorithms so the combinations are absolutely fine not a problem but i would recommend do not put too many things together if you are saying machine learning try to first get expertise on that our problem or not our problem my problem earlier was uh, i used to with very enthusiasm i'll sit and start a course or a, a particular course maybe on machine learning it might go up to half i will finish one assignment and then I'll go for the next assignment. I'll scratch my head. Too difficult to complete. Then I lose my interest and forget about it. We do not have that dedication and focus to complete that. We always have enthusiasm to start. So the word when you say I'm interested to do that, it is not about interested. I have to do that. When you think that I have to do that, then only you have to complete. And that is all, all depends upon this particular company requires a person in another one year. If you're ready with following techniques, they will take you a job. Then you will sit and do this. So that is what, uh, it's it's a human nature. So we have to go with it. But things are much more improved. I can see during lockdown, many students and many people were being posting 
uh, what they took from Coursera and many things. So it is more, much more productive and nowadays during the lockdown. But after six months of lockdown, I can see the productivity is going down, being working from home because of its own reasons. But that's okay. But otherwise, your combinations are good, but be more focused. Um, yeah, I have a personal question of my own because I have also faced these uh, problems actually. Um, so there can be skills that we might have gained throughout our life. And uh, sometimes employers look for a person who probably would, uh, he would require those uh, experiences. So many times we fail to showcase this in our uh, CV or interview. How did you approach mm -hmm. this uh, and what could be the solution for this? Very valid question. That is what I mentioned in, in between my slides. Uh, sir, until unless someone gives us a job, how can we get uh, promoted from a pressure to an experienced candidate? So someone should give a starting point for us. Now, how to start that? That is what uh, we are lacking. We are not doing our homework. Now, let's imagine that uh, we have to join. Okay, let, me, let me think first. No, let me do it as a bioinformatician. And I have to join a company as a data scientist. There is an opening. They said zero to two years of experience. That's what they said, zero to two. But zero experience, they are not going to anyway consider, which we know based on the job description that they have given. If uh, in our curriculum, most of the things are not covered also. But if you are being very proactive, you went for an internship and chose that challenging part which you wanted to do or which you wanted to learn. Most of the time here, what it happens is you go and do an internship which you already know. For the namesake of submission of your reports and certificates, I'm not generalizing for everybody, but in most cases. Uh, so excuse me, don't. Uh, it's not a, a conflict thing. <laughs> so uh, what it happens is most of the time, whatever we learn, we are trying to apply on a project and get it out and uh, finish with the uh, things and get the credits. There are many students who take it as a challenge. They wanted to learn something new, absolutely new, which they have never heard of. And some they take it because of the interest that they have shown. Because internship is kind of, in some companies, it's a learning period. In some companies, they wanted to make use of their valuable time for some specific projects. It all depends upon what, why they are hiring internships. So if you can learn and upskill yourself, that is one. Second is, there are plenty of uh, platforms like Coursera, then edX, Udemy. Of course, you need not to pay. You can audit the classes and try to complete all the assignments and upskill yourself. And when you're writing on your CV, you can see and uh, try to write your own uh, codes also. Uh, that is something very important when you apply for machine learning or data science or even bioinformatics code related jobs because they wanted to see something what you have already done. They're not looking at only your publications. What you can do is do, do your own coding, upload it to GitHub. GitHub is a very sharing platform, right? A code sharing platform. And also you can put it on uh, Senodo, Z-E-N-O-D-O. So there you put, and you put your links in your CV, right? I'm talking about a fresher. Or you did already a project and you present it somewhere and you put the links of that, or you put it in GitHub and put that link. Because when you write in your CV, they'll say, ah, attended a lot of uh, conference, uh, uh, po uh, posted or uh, presented a lot of posters. What is this poster? Just from a single title, they cannot understand what is your potential. Try to showcase it somewhere. Uh, my professor has told me, you need to know how to sell yourself in the job market in order to get a job for a fresher. If you do not know to sell yourself, you will never get a job, even if you're a first rank holder. That is the difference here. So you have to showcase yourself wherever possible in a very optimal way, not too much. So uh, that's where you have to do it. Uh, it's not only about LinkedIn. It's not only about Hub but uh, other people has to use it. So when you go to GitHub, uh, people can see how many of them have used your uh, code for other purpose. And in earlier days, uh, which I have noticed when I applied for jobs, of course, they, I have went for the last uh, uh, interview and uh, uh, until the final round, uh, since I don't have PhD, I couldn't go through the next step. So what happened there was, uh, they were uh, looking at uh, Google my name and they were looking at my social media. Uh, of course, everybody can view our social media. Public profiles are there, right? After that, I disabled my public view of uh, Facebook, right? Nobody can view my profile now. So uh, um, the recruiters are looking at all possible data to understand your presence. What is that special in you? Why should they recruit you? 
if they recruit you they do they have any benefit that's what we have to look at and the same story when you try to see in some of the institutes they hire freshers and the pay salary package is like 2 crore 1 crore 50 lakhs per annum they are all freshers but they might have upskilled something which we are lacking so don't think that only learning what is in the books and getting marks is going to get a safe job no it is very competitive and even the employees are also at risk unless some innovative things happen they cannot get new projects until new projects comes in they cannot retain you so you have to innovate and come up with something a simple example i'll tell you everybody does molecular dynamics no problem some way i sat and thought and i wrote a jupiter notebook for doing performing molecular dynamics I didn't know that, uh, uh, I thought that many would have done earlier, many would have done. I have, si I have seen uh, MD analysis, five tracks, they have done for data analysis, but not to run the MD uh, simulation itself. So think something differently and try to do it, put it in the public, let others see it. And when they see it, if they're really serious, they don't look at whether you're a fresher. Uh, they saw what they require, you have already been done, you have already showcased it. So it all depends upon different domain to domain. I cannot generalize it, but this is my take home message for people who are saying that I'm a fresher, how can I crack through the job? Uh, there are a few more questions. Uh, is it fine if I can ask? Uh, we are actually 20 minutes uh, uh, you know, ahead of the talk. I, so. have, I, have, I have 15 more minutes with me, so no problem. It's up to your timing. Okay. Um, Okay, so the next question, which uh, again I had in mind, and which probably others would also have in their future careers, would be like, uh, you know, we usually do like, but we usually take two uh, different routes. In one route, it would be like bachelor's, master's, PhD, and then join the academia. On the other route, it would be master's, industry, and then you just uh, improve your career in the industry. But how uh, difficult is it to transition between? different careers and uh, how is it feasible for a bioinformatician in your experience a very difficult question but i'll try to say from my experience uh, <laughs> so one of the transition you told me all throughout academic and research the yes. other transition you told me uh, between academy and industry yes yeah so uh, earlier days it was something different because i was uh, after my studies I went into uh, uh, teaching uh, just for one and a half year, and then I moved to industry. After moving to industry, uh, uh, so this is the story goes. So after my P um, masters, I got an opportunity to do PhD in the same university with stipend, but I uh, um, um, like I denied the offer and went for a job uh, because of other commitments, of course. All I am sure that everybody will having education loans and everything. So commitments will be there. So that was my priority to get a job rather than study. So when I went for that, uh, after that, uh, I when I made my things more stable, uh, commitments were got reduced, risk factor got reduced. Then I thought, okay, it's now time for me to do PhD. Of course, it was too late when I thought, but anyway, uh, that was a passion. So when I went for doing PhD in, in an Indian institution, the first thing the professor told me, and it is a very valid uh, point. Giri, so far you were being a manager, you were uh, controlling and doing projects, but now you have come to a level of a researcher. Uh, things will be completely different. You have to make your mindset uh, in a different way. Don't think this is industry. That is very, very true. You have to adjust and be prepared with yourself on that transition. Uh, it is a kind of a cultural shock also, <laughs> not absolutely, but uh, uh, within the, uh, what is it, domain cultural shock, that will be there. The things, uh, for example, in company, we say no, that is very straightforward, no problem. But in academy, when you say no, you're offended. That's a bit different. So that transition was a bit challenging for me. But uh, later it was okay. Uh, I, uh, I understood that has to be changed. That is one way. Second way is, uh, when you are more, ex uh, when you are in a higher position, let's say in uh, now, it, if you take my example, like uh, I am being cited as a director and a CEO. Now, if I am going to apply for uh, some postdoc, for example, a postdoc, or if I am going to apply for uh, assistant professor uh, contract, contractual, they might think, uh, why he is going down? Why is he getting down? He's a CEO. He's a director. 
you might even if you're efficient you might not get the job because of that factor i'm not generalizing all of them but from my experience i'm telling you i have faced two experiences on that uh, just to discuss and just uh, oh no 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 you're on a top level we cannot think about uh, giving you those options so uh, that thing we have to decide which i have not planned earlier so you have to really sit and think if i go this route what are the glitches going to come so i have to be really prepared if i go with the route b these are the other glitches coming so i have to decide so uh, something called as mind map i don't know how many of you do that uh, i used to do mind map only when i'm writing papers and the thesis now mind maps are also required when you wanted to take decisions so this is very very trivial and important so mind map is something that you write the key points and then based on that you try to think uh, you think all positive negatives and then take decisions and expand it and finally uh, design your route which one i have to take so all of you take a paper and do the mind map on deciding your routes and then you will be much more clear on what are the hiccups in front of you and where you have to take deviations and others so very and generalized uh, and that i can tell you for that question uh, one of the users has asked like um uh, please suggest for a, a biochemistry student uh, who wants to incorporate bioinformatics in his research. If he doesn't know much about bioinformatics, where does he have to start with from scratch? So uh, that so, is his question. Yeah. Sure. So when, you, when you're looking at more of mechanism, of course, there will be uh, several targets available. Uh, so you have to understand, go to the uh, uh, what is it, micro level, like molecular level and understand what are the key amino acids in these uh, target or enzymes, uh, which is the key factor for change in upregulation or downregulation of these mechanisms? So uh, that way, of course, either through literature or biological databases, and there are some bioinformatics tools which is going to help you to find that. Uh, that is one way. The other way to start is um, uh, like uh, pathway analyzers are there, like KEK pathways. So if a drug uh, is being administered, uh, it goes through which pathway? It's all based upon the previous experimental data. It's all based on the previous experimental data, nothing on hypothesis or anything like that. Okay. It's nothing based on... Uh, Where are we actually today? Mortality is like this thing that philosophers will find oh, for millennia. Sorry, just a minute. <laughs> right. New and so far as it's new that anything actually works, right? right. Oh, just a minute. Some other audio came in in between. Okay, so uh, that that is what um, uh, my focus is on. Uh, I, I don't know whether. Uh, sorry for the interruption. I don't know whether I answered that question. No, it was uh, fine. Uh, I think you uh, covered many of the points already. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so I have a, a, a one final question, and uh, so just to summarize everything together, also one of the users, uh, Praveen, has asked this question. So uh, as fishers, everybody has a doubt in mind whether we should just run for jobs, and uh, you know how uh, their careers will uh, uh, go ahead, and uh, how to handle failures, or you know how to uh, switch uh, uh, from careers. So how to handle this pressure? Because this uh, always it happens uh, as you know, uh, like we are always confused, and at the same time we contemplate if we made mistakes or whatever, and mm -hmm. we end up in a very negative kind of a um, you know feeling. So, what would you suggest about that? So, uh, I understand uh, this question. What is trying to say? One thing is, uh, as I told you earlier, for me it was there was financial commitment. So my priority was not higher education. My priority was start uh, repaying the loans. So uh, for person to person, things will be different. And in most of the cases, the same situation is there, I'm sure. But in other cases, if you do not have much commitments, then uh, even though you do not want uh, to go for a job, I would recommend you to go for, if you can get a job, uh, at least for one or two years, go for a job and then further go for higher studies. Because, uh, there's a big difference in doing that. If you go for this um, uh, IIM or any other MBA, uh, they mostly prefer uh, uh, students who are coming after at least one year of experience after working in a company. 
uh, that has big sense because uh, the aptitude and the expectations everything will change when you start working for an institution it can be a company or academic or whatever it will be and there will be a different kind of stress level different life of pressure time deadline meetings and everything will be there and after that when you go for uh, higher studies that is absolutely fine but here the more focus was i have to start earning because there are many things to be done so this will be a great pressure either maybe from parents or by yourself the only way to go through is you have to do start doing your homework uh, about 6 months before your graduation uh, to estimate yourself where you have to focus on applying and what you have to get ready for a particular kind of job one second if you do not have too much of uh, commitments try to make uh, talk to your parents and make them understand can you give me some more time like i have asked my dad so get some more time uh, give them trust uh, talk to them much more uh, give them examples but ensure that you uh, as uh, uh, um, um, abhishek was rightly saying uh, don't go to negative or disappointing factor so you have to do a lot of research research in the sense of reading understanding others experiences uh, different scenarios because uh, one challenging part nowadays what i see is we cannot generalize many of the things it changes from minute to minute place to place institute to institute even person to person things are different so you have to be very careful in making the choices but uh, please uh, talk to uh, start uh, talking each other rather than keeping in your mind uh, be open uh, and discuss about these factors and what is your feel first you have to talk about that so recently uh, uh, one of my student called me Uh, sir i am about to get a uh, uh, um, admission for mtech bioinformatics uh, but i am a biotechnology student how do you think that uh, i am is it okay with me i clearly told her that see no problem in taking it absolutely fine but be confident that you can learn programming be confident that you are going for a data analytics or data science side of bioinformatics but if you are sticking on only biology like what you did for biotechnology then i am a little bit uh, saying to towards no but um, uh, by hearing this answer she felt a little bit bad uh, because i'm 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 giving a cryptic answer right uh, but uh, later she uh, uh, understood that uh, where we have to focus to get a job ready factor so now i uh, she has decided to go to take uh, bioinformatics and uh, she has now a very clear plan after bioinformatics what she is going to do and where will she wanted to work so she is doing her homework right away so in order to avoid the stress and the pressure you have to it might be too late already but try to make your objectives what is missing for me what i have to do for the next uh, few days or few months or few weeks before i start applying for jobs so you have to prepare something called as mind map as well as gantt graph g a n t t so gan graph tells you a time frame where you have to finish a specific task so if you can plan things accordingly i'm sure uh, you do not have too much of stress or bad feeling about oh, i couldn't crack the interview because you are already getting ready to for that particular job to me thank you very much uh, i think uh, there would be many more questions uh, for sure um if there are many more uh, any more questions you can directly contact uh, dr pille and also uh, post questions in the uh, telegram uh, group of uh, llb bioinfo and uh, llb school uh, i uh, i would just uh, want to uh, sort of summarize the whole talk and i think uh, from this uh, particular talk you would get different perspectives uh, what dr pille shared and also from our question answer session that Uh, a lot of self introspection uh, um, requirements of skill sets uh, as well as um, improving or upskilling your uh, uh, skills is very very important and these uh, skills actually maintain uh, help us to maintain uh, our uh, cv not only our cv uh, in front of the employer but also gives a good confidence to us that we uh, can uh, do better and choose the right career the right important career for uh, from a personal perspective at the same time uh, it's also important to note uh, uh, what dr uh, pillai rightly said is that 
uh, we should keep on uh, trying out new things and be updated with uh, what's uh, happening and should have the right purpose to choose a particular career uh, path. So I think uh, with this, I will just uh, uh, thank Dr. Pillay again uh, for having a very nice uh, chat. Um, and I hand it over to Mahesh uh, if, he ha if he wants to add something more uh, to this. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Yeah. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, thanks for the taking care of, thank you for taking care of the question and answer session. And thank you, Dr. Giri, for uh, taking us throughout your journey as well as telling some, answering all the questions with patience and your time. And for uh, like formally, uh, I would request Ms. Nishitza to deliver the vote of thanks for this session. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek, sir, for the interactive question and answer session. Also, our speaker, Dr. Girinath Pillai, sir for answering all the questions with patience. On behalf of LLB School and our organizing team, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this session. My heart fills with lots of gratitude and respect for our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Girinath Palaisa, for not only sparing his valuable time for us to grace this session, but also for enlightening with us with his commendable talk on bioinformatics. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your excellent journey with your rich experience on international fellowships and many informatic, informative aspects. Overall, it's a very good experience, and we will be happy to have you in our future sessions as well. I'm sure our participants will be having a great motivation. And at this moment, we also express our thanks to Dr. Abhishek, sir, for making this session possible. Also, we extend our thanks to our collaborators, CPMB, Center for Plant Molecular Biotechnology, and TNAU, uh, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, and IMOT, Agri Forum. And now it's my pleasure to thank our participants who made the session as great successful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great day then. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So participants who are asking for certificates will be shared in the LLB school telegram channel. The link will be shared. So the feedback page link will be shared in the telegram channel. So I'm posting the link again. Thank you for joining.